here's how I can handle the questions. I'll tell people, I'll answer your questions at the end, and once in a while I'll take one in a talk, but if I start doing that, I stop it because you're losing control of the talk. So I'll say, listen, I'll, because of the interest of time, I'll take your questions at the end, and then when I'm done and I make the close, so what I have, and, and my staff will tell you this, I tell my staff this, when I do this lecture and I do the close at the end, I'm going to say, let me answer your questions but first, I want to ask you a question, and I'm going to survey you. And then once I get that question answered, and I say, okay, now I'll start taking questions, my staff knows, because this the first time I did this, it went like this. I said, so when I'm done, I'm going to, when I start answering the questions, you just go around and sign them all up. Okay? So I get to the end, and I do the close, and it goes perfect, and I go, okay, first question. And my staff goes, and they're like waiting for the question, like, and I'm like, no, 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 you guys keep going. And like, cause so get your staff, role play it. When I say at this point in the lecture, you guys go up and just go up to people, and what they say is this, I can sign you up for that appointment. Not like, do you want to do it? Because if you don't role play that, that's what your staff's going to do. You know, you might have gone through all this training of trying to not be reasonable about their objections, but your staff, if you don't role play with them, they're going to go up and want to be liked. And if somebody says, well, I don't know, I've got to think about it. Okay, so what you say is, I can sign you up for that. And if then they go, well, I don't know, i got to think about it. Okay, well, the purpose of signing up for this is so you can get more information so you can think about it. Most people sign up. And if they go, no, no you're trying to pressure me. Oh, no, okay, no pressure. So I can sign up for that appointment. And they just go around the room like um, roadies at a concert. So you never even see them. And they're just signing people up while you're asking, answering questions. The reason I do it that way is I am holding the audience hostage. If you don't answer questions and your staff wait until the very end, and then they sign them up, people just walk out the door. But if they're signing up while you're answering questions, they don't want to miss something, so you just, do you see how that works? It works great. So I answer questions while my staff is signing up. It's not like I magically appear, do the talk, and magically disappear. I stay there. I want to interact with these people. Okay, They're going to bond with me. So you're going to see stuff in this presentation like, I got pictures of my family. Do not use pictures of my family. <laughs> use pictures of your family. And if you don't want to talk about your family, don't talk about your family. But I want them to bond with me. I talk about <coughs> AMI. That doesn't mean you don't have to talk about, or you should talk about AMI. You can if you want to. But don't make it look like I'm the expert, because they're never going to meet me. You're the expert. Do you understand that? So you'll see that I'm doing that. I'm giving them a reason to listen to me. So number one, I'm giving them a reason to listen to, to me. Number two, you're going to show, I'm going to show you how I ruin the audience and have them realize, when I say ruin, they realize this healthcare system is ruining me. That's the realization I want them to have. So I'm going to talk about healthcare. Then I'm going to talk about their conditions. There are things in here that I know are their buttons. So I'm going to try to hit as many of those buttons. You know what a button is? A button is something that somebody's very sensitive about. So let's say Bryce has a button on blue suit coats. And I show up wearing a blue suit coat, right? He's all of a sudden like, oh, that's true. He is a weirdo. Or something like that. That's a bad example. Let's say he has a button on his shoulder, and I start saying, and people with shoulder problems, all of a sudden he perks right up. I have a shoulder problem. So I'm going to want to cover these things. I'm going to want to talk about knee problems, hip problems, back problems. So just pay attention to that. And then at the end, what's my product? Get him into the office. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, getting him to sign up for the office is not getting him into the office. Do you understand that? So I have a method of getting them more likely to show, show up. Okay, And there's two things I'm going to do at the end that will show you how I do that. You guys ready? Yeah. Okay. Can I put that right there? Sure. All right. If you need to move that, go, feel free. Okay. All right. So I'm Dr. Carberry, and I'm here to talk to you about regenerative medicine. And a lot of you came here because you wanted to learn about stem cells, right? Raise your hand if you wanted to learn about stem cells. Okay. Well, regenerative medicine is the use of different substances in the body, including stem, stem cells, on how to repair yourself. So we're going to talk about this. So um, PRP, Wharton's jelly, cord blood, how many of you ever heard of any of these terms? OK, by the end of this talk, you'll have a good understanding of what that is. OK? Fair enough? OK, so that's my name right there, Michael Carberry, DC. What does DC stand for? Doctor of Cause. Doctor of Chiropractic. So now you're all sitting there going, oh, crap, I just went to a talk on a medical service, and that's a chiropractor giving it, right? So to understand how I actually got in front of you to be able to explain this, i got to tell you a story. Is it OK if I tell you a story? OK. 
So that's my family. I'm a very fortunate guy. I have four beautiful daughters and a beautiful wife. My wife is a physical therapist. And when I met her, her main job was to wake people up out of a coma from a head injury or a stroke. I was not involved in healthcare. I was not a chiropractor. I had no idea that I was going to end up going into healthcare. I was a business guy. I went to school for a business degree. I was working for one of the largest marketing companies in the world. And while we were dating, I had a pretty serious neck injury. It even left me temporarily paralyzed for about a minute. But I got to tell you, that was the longest minute of my life because there was nobody standing there telling me, don't worry about it. You're going to get it all back. It was just like, I can't feel anything from my neck down. I'm having trouble breathing. So it scared the daylights out of me. So what happened was I went to the hospital. And I, by this point, I was up and walking. And I was moving, but I was in a lot of pain. And um, the doctor prescribed drugs, medication. They said, we don't know what you did. First, he said, I think you broke your neck. Then he said, good news is you didn't break your neck. Bad news is I don't know what you did. So here's a bunch of medication. Here's a list of neurologists. Good luck. Get your, get your neck problem fixed. So I started doing that. Now, you should know that my wife's brother-in-law was the vice president of a pharmaceutical company. He was the vice president of research of a pharmaceutical company. He actually invented drugs. My wife's sister, not his wife, but her other sister, is the vice president of safety of the third largest pharmaceutical company in the planet. So I get to go to barbecues with vice presidents of pharmaceutical companies. And so when I sat there at Easter dinner one time and somebody said, how's your neck doing? And I said, well, I think I'm going to go to a chiropractor. Everybody fell out of their chairs, and I had to revive them all because they were like, that's the worst thing you could possibly do. And they tried to talk me out of it, but I decided to go. Anybody here go to a chiropractor? OK, good. So you can understand what the, where the story is going. The chiropractor fixed me. It was such a life-changing experience. I actually, against everybody's advice, quit my job and went back to school to become a chiropractor. And I came out of school and had a huge practice in Pennsylvania, so huge that and I, I, it was one of the largest chiropractic practices on the East Coast. Um, so what I started re realizing is I was treating people with chronic degenerative arthritis. A lot of you are here for chronic degenerative arthritis or old injuries. And I started realizing there was more to it than just chiropractic. Chiropractic was great. It saved my life. I've saved a lot of people's lives. But I realized people start losing their posture when they have degenerative problems. And physical therapy would be a good thing to add to that. And I'm married to a physical therapist, so I thought, this is perfect. Well, Pennsylvania is a state that says if a physical therapist works with a chiropractor and works off his referral, she has to lose her license. So that wasn't good. So I thought, well, what do I do next? And somebody said, why don't you work with medical doctors? So I actually started this. My wife and I started a, a clinic that has a team approach based on results. That's what makes it different from other medical clinics. And we use an integrated medical approach. That means they all work together not just in the same building. They work on the same team. All the patients that treat in our office are treated by the whole team. And what they do, we have medical doctors, nurse practitioners, chiropractors, and physical therapists prescribing exercise, rehab, and doing things like very safe injections to help reverse the effects of arthritis. And it worked really, really good. This company got really, really big. We helped a lot of people. In fact, I was asked to start a nationwide company to teach it to other clinics and we have close to 500 clinics now around the United States in 43 states. And this clinic that we have here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, is the training center for that. So it's a, a teaching facility. So what we do is we try, we focus on exercise, rehab, weight loss, and nutrition, and very safe, non-invasive treatments to reverse the effects of arthritis and you know, chronic degenerative problems and postural problems. So, our purpose is to help as many people who suffer with things like shoulder pain, knee pain, elbow pain, hip and back pain, failed back surgery, rotator cuff tears, meniscal tears, all these things that happen to people when you go through life, this is what we focus on. We have a great track record on doing that. Even foot pain, um, we had podiatrists approach us and want to be part of our group, and they actually started creating practices that had the same groups of people, but they added to it also podiatrists. So this is what we do. Now, because I've done this idea and I've pioneered this and a lot of people are putting this model in place, are these all my water bottles? I do have a drinking problem, I should tell you that. So this one's mine, right? I'll end this one first. So I want to ask you, because I talk to so many different people, and I talk to doctors all the time. I was in Palm Springs last weekend. I'm going to be in Atlanta this weekend. I'm going to ask all of you a question. 
Ready? Do you live in a healthy country? All right, you got a lot of no's. Any yeses? Yes, of course. Okay, good. So it's good that we have different opinions because they are just opinions. So who's right? Is he right or are they right? I tend to agree with the people who say no, but still, that's just my opinion. So how do you solve that? You look at statistics. Can I share with you some statistics? Good. So the United States makes up 5% of the world's population. Did you know that? It's actually 4.6%. So of the whole population of the world, we're only 4.6%. We spend more on health care every year since they've been keeping records than the other 95% combined. Did you know that? We have the most expensive health care on the planet, bar none. We consume over 75% of the world's medication. Did you know that? In fact, we consume 90% of the world's opioids. Did you know that? Raise your hand if you knew that. Just a couple. So, how many of you ever heard of this woman, Dr. Barbara Starfield? Couple, okay, good. Dr. Barbara Starfield was a medical doctor and a master's of public health, and she was the department head of health policy and management at Johns Hopkins University Medical School. You ever hear of that school? Okay, Johns Hopkins University Medical School is considered the national medical school. Um, so what she did was she actually wanted to write a study on this to see how effective is our health care in this country. And the way she was going to do it is she was going to compare Americans in, statistically in about 200 different categories with 12 other countries. So she said, let's give me the, thir the top 13 richest countries in the world, the United States being number one, and compare us against the other 13 and see how we do. Sound good? Okay, so here's what she came up with. She said, she, her article was published, she started publishing it in multiple articles. The first article was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association in July of 2000 on the effectiveness of healthcare. And this is the first thing she discovered. She discovered that the third leading cause of death in the United States is side effects from medical treatment. Do you get that? Let me, let me show you. She broke it down. She said 106,000 Americans die from the side effects of drugs that were properly prescribed. Do you get that? That means it was not a mistake and not too much and not an overdose. It was properly prescribed and the side effects of the drug killed the patient. That's 106,000 Americans every year. How many people died in Vietnam in 10 years, in Americans? 58,000. 58, We're doubling that every year, okay? She said 80,000 people in this country check into the hospital to get something done. They catch an infection in the hospital they did not have when they checked in, and the infection kills them. She said 12,000 people die from the side effects of surgery they should have never have gotten. She said 7,000 people die from getting the wrong dosage or the wrong medication, and 20,000 die from other errors. That came up to be 225,000 deaths per year, which made it the third leading cause of death in the United States that year. And it's been that way every year since. And then she said this, I only counted deaths in a hospital setting, not in private practice and not in nursing homes. So it could be higher. Raise your hand if that disturbs you. Yeah, good, because it should disturb you. Um, so she was like, okay, the, there's something majorly wrong here. So what happened was, that was in 2000. In 2013, her study was repeated. And this time, they compared the United States to 16 other countries. So it was the top 17 countries, okay? Unfortunately, Dr. Starfield could not participate in this study because in 2011, she was on a medication and the doctor gave her another medication with it, which interacted with the first medication and she died from it. The exact thing she reported is what killed her. So when they compared this, here's some of the different categories. There was hundreds of them. I read the entire study front to, it was like a real sleeper. You know, you wanna get some sleep, you read a study like that. But I read the whole thing. And here's some of the categories. 
overweight. We are the heaviest country in both studies. And in fact, the heaviest country in the world. Who's number two? Mexico. Mexico. But they've never been able to knock us out of number one state, or number one co country. Um, when I was in college, we were not the heaviest country in the world. That was back in the 1980s, early 80s, started college in the 1970s. Um, we were not the heaviest country in the world. One of the heaviest countries in the world was Russia. But America gained an average of 30 pounds per person since then. So with that came a bunch of problems. They said, well, maybe the reason Americans are all overweight is because we're all bodybuilders. And they got muscle. And that you, know, you can be obese and be really muscular, right? Sorry, that wasn't the case. They said we had the worst body mass index in the world, meaning we have the highest fat to muscle ratio. Now, what's wrong with that problem? The real concern about that is the more fat you have compared to muscle, the lower your metabolism is. What's the definition of metabolism? The rate that you burn calories. Well, not just burn calories. What are, we, what are you doing? What's that metabolism doing? Healing. healing. It's the rate of healing, and it's measured by burning calories. It's the rate of healing of the body. And if you have bad body mass index, which we have the worst in the world, we have the lowest healing rate. So who's it starting to look like it was correct? That America's healthy or America's not healthy? Exactly. They looked at diabetes, highest diabetic rate, not only in both studies, but on the planet. They said in this study, <coughs> excuse me, Americans have a two and a half times greater chance of being a diabetic because they're Americans. That's crazy. Infant mortality, which has nothing to do with the first three categories. This is how well does a baby survive the first year of life? We took last place in both studies. Last place. That's like this. <laughs> so probability of dying in the safe years. You know, when you're born, your probability of dying is higher. When you hit about 15, it goes down. And it stays down until you hit about 50, and it starts going back up again. So they compared us on this. And some of the countries in the study were actually at war. And they did better than we did. That's insane. We did so bad, we took last place in 90% of the categories, last place in 90% of the categories that they renamed the study after they looked at the stats, the US health disadvantage. So it is not our opinion, it is actual fact that our healthcare system is the most expensive, inefficient healthcare system in the world. And most of you knew that, right? So who do we get to blame for that? I hear a couple people saying us. Usually people say, well, the drug companies, the senators, or whatever. The insurance companies. No, it's us, including me. Why do I take that position? What do you think? If you don't assume responsibility for something, you're never going to fix it. Am I right? If you don't assume responsibility for something, you will never fix it. So I take responsibility for this, saying I did not do enough to change this, which is why I'm here talking to you tonight. Do you understand that? See, I know there's ways that you can actually get healthy and safer and less expensive, so that's what I do. I bring those ideas to the public. That's why I'm here talking to you tonight. So if we look at it, our viewpoint has to change. The way we look at disease is what gets us into this mess. Do you understand that? Everybody understand that? Raise your hand if you understand it. Good. Raise your hand if you don't understand it. Okay, good. Raise your hand if you didn't raise your hand so far. 